Okay, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, I think we'll make a start. For those of you who uh, regularly attend these events, you'll notice that I'm not John Tomney. Uh, our normal host has disappeared, so he's left me uh, to do the introductions this evening. So welcome to the uh, fourth uh, of our uh, public lecture series. Um, this series is generously sponsored by Capita. I'm sort of looking out for any Capita colleagues here tonight. Um, but I, I don't think I can see any. Hopefully some will join us later. They're due to come for dinner, so I, I expect they will. Um, but uh, we're very grateful to Capita for the sponsorship uh, of, of this series. Um, my name's Nick Gallant. Um, I'm head of the Bartlett School of Planning, uh, and I'll um, chair the proceedings this evening. Um, our speaker will speak for 45 minutes or so, and there will be an opportunity for questions afterwards. Um, the aim uh, of these lectures is to bring leading scholars and professionals in front of an audience of our students, uh, staff, and uh, guests to address important uh, academic debates and pressing issues of policy and practice. And it's our custom, as many of you will know, um, to head to a reception, uh, an event afterwards, which is an opportunity to talk further uh, with the speaker or just network generally. And tonight that event is in South Cloisters. Um, many of you will know where that is. If you don't, you'll see me dash out the door at the end uh, to get to the front of the queue. So just, just follow me. So it's a particular pleasure to introduce uh, this evening's speaker. Uh, Rob Kitchen is, professor, uh, is a professor and e e ERC, European Research Council, mm -hmm. uh, advanced investigator at the National Institute of Regional and Spatial Analysis at Maynooth University, for which he was director between 2002 and 2013. He's one of Ireland's leading uh, social scientists and was the 2013 recipient of the Royal Irish Academy's Gold Medal uh, for the Social Sciences and the Association of American Geographers Meridian Book Award for the outstanding book in the discipline uh, in 2011. He studied at Lancaster University, Leicester University, and the University of Wales Swansea, uh, where he obtained his PhD. He took up a post in Queen's University in Belfast in 1996, and moved to Maynooth in 1998. He's published widely across the social sciences and is the author of 23 books. 23 books is a lot of books, so I'm I'll hopefully he'll have some tips for the rest of us a little bit them. later. And 140 um, articles and book chapters. He's editor of the international journal Dialogues in Human Geography and has been an editor of Progress in Human Geography and Social and Cultural Geography. He was the editor-in-chief of the 12-volume International Encyclopedia of Human Geography, which I contributed to. I don't know if you remember. Okay. Uh, one very small contribution. And edits two books, uh, two book series, Irish Society and Key Concepts in Geography. He has successfully written or been principal investigator on 40 research grants valued at more than 30 uh, million uh, euros. He's currently a principal investigator on the Programmable City Project, uh, the Digital Repository of Ireland, the All Island Research Observatory, and the Dublin Dashboard. He has just delivered at more than 130 invited talks at conferences and universities um, uh, internationally. But not only uh, has he uh, done all of this, um, he's also the author of four crime fiction novels and two collections of short stories. Um, it's a wonderful hobby to, to have, I'm sure. Can we, can we um, call time and go to the talk? Sorry? <laughs> so, Rob, welcome to UCL, welcome to the Bartlett, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks very much for the, uh, uh, the welcome and the, the reading out of my CV. <laughs> it's slightly uh, embarrassing. I haven't, I haven't written 23 uh, books. Uh, they're, they're written and edited. So, there are 23 books, but they're not all written. Okay. Um, so what I want to do is talk about this notion of data-driven data uh, network turbanism and what's kind of happening with data uh, around uh, cities. So there's a very rich history of um, data being gener generated about cities. For as long as we've had cities, really, we've been generating data and evidence to understand what's going on. 
And urban data are a kind of a key um, input for understanding city life, for solving urban problems, uh, for guiding uh, operational uh, governance, formulating policy and plans, modeling possible uh, futures, and tackling a whole set of diverse uh, issues. Um, and so we've always kind of had data-informed uh, urbanism has, has been kind of going on. But what I want to try and make a case uh, uh, to you about is we're kind of shifting in towards a more kind of data-driven urbanism as opposed to data-informed. Uh, and really this has been driven by a kind of a, a move towards uh, the generation and analysis and use of uh, urban big data. So really that's going to be the kind of the focus of the talk really is around uh, this is kind of urban uh, big data. So this is what I kind of mean by urban big data. So, you know, traditionally uh, big data has been kind of characterized as the three Vs of volume, velocity, and uh, variety. I really think the two key characteristics are velocity and exhaustivity. So we're, we're not talking necessarily about sample data here. We're talking about N equals all data sets. Okay, so it's everybody who's on social media. It's every car that's on the road network. It's every passenger who's in uh, the transport system, and so on. That doesn't necessarily mean all the analysis is done on the entire data set, but the entire da data set is being captured, the entire population. Okay? And there's very few data sets previous to that where we had that kind of uh, sampling. Maybe the census was one example, but of course uh, there was no velocity on census data in Britain. It's once every 10 years, and you wouldn't get the data for another 18 months to two years uh, after that. Okay? Whereas now we've got a kind of a generation of much more kind of free-flowing uh, data across a whole set of different domains. So things like surveillance, high-definition, high high-res uh, high uh, CCTV, digital CCTV footage, footage that might be coming off of drones and satellites and so on, scaled public administration records, and we have public administration records being generated on a much more regular uh, basis, so kind of indicator data uh, and so on. This kind of generated on a kind of continual basis uh, rather than... Um, maybe once a year or whatever. And, but I've kind of said directed in the sense of there's somebody in charge of the process, somebody's directing the camera, somebody's uh, doing, uh, uh, choosing what questions to ask and so on. We also have more kind of automated forms of data generation, whether that's kind of forms of automated uh, surveillance, um, whether that's uh, digital devices, so kind of the Internet of Things and various different kinds of devices can in, uh, networked up and generation all kinds of uh, data. And of course, the classic one is the spy in your pocket, your, uh, your smartphone. Okay, so there's loads of data pouring off of this, and I'll show you exactly what data is coming off of this uh, later on. But even though I'm not using this phone, the phone is, there's data pouring off this phone. Uh, if I've got a location aware app on, on here, it's typically, it's typically telling the app owner and the uh, telecoms company where I am about every four minutes. Uh, and then there's kind of all kinds of sensors and actuators and meters and transponders that are being embedded into the environment that are pouring back uh, different bits of data, whether that's sound sensors or pollution sensors or flood level monitoring sensors or whatever it might be. And of course, there's all kinds of interactions and transactions that we might uh, 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 conduct through uh, various uh, uh, interfaces and so on. And then it's kind of data that we volunteer ourselves. So things like uh, social media or locative media, we might check in on Foursquare and so on, or we might be on uh, Twitter, we might have it, uh, uh, or, or on Facebook or somewhere where, it, where we're revealing where we are through, uh, uh, through the posts and so on. It might be through surveillance and wearables, so we might be wearing a Fitbit or a Nike fuel band and so on that's measuring our health and our pulse and our heartbeat and our blood pressure and whatever else number of steps and so on, uh, sharing it again with the app provider. Um, it might be kind of crowdsourcing or forms of neo-geography, so things like um, uh, uh, contributing to OpenStreetMap, it might be uh, geotagging of, uh, of articles in Wikipedia or something like that, um, or it could be citizen science, so you could, I know, for example, have your own weather station in the back in your back garden and you could plug it in into Wonderground and it'll update your, uh, your kind of readings off all the various sensors on your, on your weather station to do with rain and uh, humidity and air pressure and so on and so forth. Okay. And they're quite cheap now. I have one of those in my back garden. I think it was 100 quid or something. It's about 13 different sensors on it. And you can kind of contribute that back into kind of science projects. 
And there's kind of a whole range and diverse set of public and private uh, interests who are now kind of generating this data, which typically is quite fine uh, grained, so it's uniquely indexical. This phone is, has four or five different IDs on it that, I, that make it uh, unique and can be uh, traced and uh, tracked. Um, I have a whole series of personal identifiers related to me, like in Ireland I have my uh, PPS number, my uh, social security number and so on. I have addresses and, and so on. So we have a whole series of unique indexical things now with, uh, for people, for things, uh, for places, for transactions, for interactions and so on. They're kind of indexical uh, kind of relations. And they've been reduced by all kinds of people like uh, utility companies, so smart meters in measuring your gas usage or your water usage and so on. Your transport providers, so using your Oyster car to tap in and tap out. Um, uh, environmental agencies collecting data about pollution and flooding and so on. Uh, mobile phone operators and all of the various apps that are on your phones. Uh, social media sites, travel and accommodation sites, so things like uh, TripAdvisor and so on, where you write up reviews of different places and location-based services and so on, through to home appliances and uh, entertainment systems. Uh, so you could have a kind of like a Nest thermostat and so on, again, where you can access it through the internet using your uh, phone and so on, or your cable is typically two-way. They know what you're, what, what, what you, what you're watching automatically. Could be through the financial uh, institutions or uh, retail chains. Uh, so again, all your consumption using credit cards and, and so on and so forth, through to private uh, surveillance and uh, security firms, remote sensing aerial uh, surveying, uh, emergency services, and so on. And collectively, they're kind of producing a data deluge that can be combined, analyzed, uh, and acted upon. Now typically, typically these have been within single systems so we might have a system around uh, transport. So the top up here, are, on the top left, are transluxion loops. If you see tar loops or square loops on the, on the road, as, as you go across them, they're counting the number of cars that are going through particular junctions and so on. There's often a box hidden in a hedge on the side of the road that's then relaying that data uh, back. You have, again, CCTV footage. You might have various kinds of sensors around the road network, and it's typically feeding it back to these kind of control rooms and so on. Cars themselves are typically computers on wheels, more than 40 computers in the average uh, car these days, collecting all kinds of information from sensors from the vehicle and, and the sound of, uh, surrounding environment, et cetera. So but it can, typically it's a kind of a single uh, set of systems. So intelligent transport system is normally pulling this kind of information together and then trying to keep the traffic uh, flowing within a, within a location. But what's happening now is there's a move to try and break down the silos between those data stores and, and integrate the data. So these are four city operating uh, systems, or the attempts to create some of them. So the top left is uh, IBM's Intelligence Operations Center. The bottom left is Microsoft City Next. The top right is um, Abotica's uh, City Operating System, and the bottom right is Living Planet's Urban Operating System. And the idea here is, you, is it like your operating system on your, on your computer where you can kind of access different parts of the computer, whether it's PowerPoint or spreadsheets or, or Word or games or whatever, that you can access different parts of the city's uh, data system so you can access into the environmental data, into the transport data, uh, into the housing data and whatever. So you can kind of control elements of the city uh, centrally. And this data is feeding into these kinds of rooms and these kinds of rooms are in pretty much every city uh, these days. Uh, the top left is uh, Rio. You can't kind of do a talk on data-driven urbanism without talking about the Rio Control Center. Um, this is a, a, a center to, built principally uh, as a way of trying to help run the city uh, in the run-up uh, and through the Olympics, the Confederation Cup, and the World Cup. Okay. Lots of data feeding in here from 30 different uh, systems, so real-time data feeding in from 30 different systems, environment data, transport data, uh, weather data, pollution, whatever it might be, um, emergency services, et cetera. It's all kind of feeding into there. It's employing 400 analysts on a, on a rotation of three shifts. It's a 24-hour uh, uh, center. Bottom left is uh, uh, Sydney, I think. Top right is uh, Kawasaki, I think, in, um, uh, in Japan. And you can see some of the data 
up here is very fine-grained kind of graphs and so on that's allowing this guy to kind of look in at what's going on in different parts of the city and so on. On the bottom right one is actually a control room for a single road. This is the control room for the M25. This is what's needed to keep the traffic flowing around the M25 on any kind of uh, continual basis. Okay, so again, lots of data feeding in from transduction loops, from cameras, from sensors, and so on, and is all then feeding back out into automatically changing the road sign speeds, laid speed, the laden cameras, and all kinds of stuff. Okay. And then accompanying this kind of new data, of course, is like new forms of science to try and make uh, sense of it. So up until now, typically science has really progressed by trying to uh, take quite small, high quality data sets and then extend and generalize out from them. Whereas now we've got lots of, lots of different types of data. We cover, need different analytics and different stats and so on to try and make sense of this data. And actually, partly what we've been doing with big data is to make it small data, to take samples out of it to try and make sense of it. But there are attempts to try and deal with much larger uh, flows of data. So things like um, uh, data mining and uh, pattern recognition, data visualization and visual analytics, uh, statistical analysis, and then forms of kind of prediction and simulation uh, and optimization, forms of kind of uh, uh, modeling. And a lot of this is, is based on kind of machine learning and kind of new forms of computation that can actually process this kind of amount of data in some kind of timely uh, fashion. And then with, in relation to cities and urban studies, it's really led to uh, these kind of uh, new fields, if you like, of urban informatics and urban science that, that do build on, on previous work. They're not completely new, but they're certainly uh, growing quite rapidly, I think, and becoming quite interdisciplinary and pulling people into looking at cities that maybe uh, didn't look before. So you, you know, data scientists, computer scientists, uh, mathematicians, social, phys social physics, and so on, kind of turning their attention to trying to make sense of some of this, uh, some of this uh, data. And then some of it is getting pushed back out uh, to citizens and to others. So these are uh, three examples of those. So the top left is uh, London's one, which is developed by CASA, so uh, Mike Batty's group over the, over the way there kind of developed that. So kind of a city at a glance, so just on a single screen, you can see what's kind of going on a dashboard. The bottom one is uh, Amsterdam's, and then this one over here is uh, Dublin's. So this is an analytic dashboard. It's not at a glance has loads of layers in below this. So these are kind of top level modules and underneath that there's a whole series of other kinds of modules. And it's pulling in indicator data, so kind of city indicator data, city benchmarking data, so you can see how Dublin's doing in relation to other cities in Ireland, other cities in Europe. Uh, you can kind of look at what's kind of happening with the trends around education and health and population and housing and planning and so on. It's pulling in the real time data um, we have very good access to the real-time uh, data, so we have uh, uh, we're getting all of this, all of the data from the road sensors, the 800 road sensors. Uh, we got we've got all the live CCTV footage. Uh, we know where all the buses are. We know where all the trains are. Uh, we know where the Lewis is, which is the tram. We know what the road speeds are. Uh, we know what's coming off the sound sensors. What's coming? How many cars are in the car parks? Uh, we know the weather. We know all the boats in the, in the port. We know where they are. We know what they are. We know where they're going, what they're carrying. We know what's coming off the buoys in terms of wind speeds and tides and all this kind of stuff. So Dublin's quite progressive, and it's made its real-time data that the city's getting for governance open to everybody. So this is all open. There's nothing in here that's for the city that citizens can't get. So it's all, it's all uh, in there. And then we've got kind of all the census data and public administration mapping modules, planning modules. The Dublin near to me is location-based services. You can just say, where's the nearest post office to me? It'll tell you where it is. It'll tell you what this uh, opening hours are and so on, or what the nearest bottle bank or library, whatever it is. There's some city reporting stuff. So you can kind of say, uh, here's a pothole. Take a photo of my camera. I can upload it into Fix Your Street. And it goes straight into the CRM system of the local authority. So the CRM system is a customer relations management system. And they basically have a week to sort that out. And uh, what's meant to happen is that when they fix the pothole, they're meant to take a photo to show you that they've closed the loop and it's now fixed. Okay? But it's not you taking a photo and it goes into a system that goes nowhere. It's a system that goes directly into their workflow. And then we've got the data stores and then various apps and other bits and uh, pieces. So that's, 
Uh, that's the system that um, uh, myself and one of my postdocs developed uh, for Dublin. But it just gives you kind of a range of the data that's actually available for citizens as well as, uh, as the city itself. So the argument is, is that cities are becoming uh, ever more instrumented and networked and their systems are becoming more interlinked and integrated. And we're really at the kind of the start of that process, but that seems to be the trend uh, that's occurring. And that consequently, that cities are becoming kind of uh, knowable and controllable in new dynamic ways. So we've got urban governance happening on a real-time basis, okay, with feedback loops that are in a much more kind of real-time way. We know when the road system has stopped, where there, where there is a problem. We know where there's a problem on the system, so we know a particular sensor is broken or a, a particular camera is broken, and a company is automatically uh, called out to go and fix that, go and fix that problem. It's a, a kind of automated system within that and so on. Whereas before, obviously, things were a lot slower, different kind of feedback channels uh, and so on. So it's kind of changing how cities are being kind of run and uh, managed. Um, so they're becoming kind of, my argument is really they're becoming responsive to a kind of form of network, networked urbanism in which big data systems are kind of prefiguring and setting uh, the urban agenda. They're producing a deluge of contextual and actionable uh, data and they're influencing and controlling how cities respond and perform in real time. And really this kind of data-driven networked urbanism is the kind of mode of production underpinning uh, the development of smart cities, which is probably how most of you might be familiar with this kind of stuff, is through the literature around uh, smart cities. And so the argument within smart cities is we can kind of take all this data and knowledge and new information and so on, and it helps kind of, helps us tackle kind of pressing uh, urban issues. As I've already argued, introduces new forms of uh, governance. It kind of enables the city to become more efficient or competitive or productive in its service uh, delivery, so you can go kind of get efficiencies about how you uh, deliver stuff. Uh, you can kind of get more transparency and accountability in terms of what's going on. So we have a lot more data about city service provision uh, that can be pushed out to the public and people can see whether, whether the local authorities and so on are actually uh, doing the kinds of work that we hope that they're uh, doing. So the data can kind of uh, enhance participation in city life and increase quality of life because a lot of this data can then feed off into apps and we can use the apps to see what's going on. So you might have apps that, I don't know, pull in TFL data that tells you what's kind of going on with a bus system or the train system and allow you to make uh, different journey times. So we might have real-time passenger information at the bus stops and so on. Okay, so it's increasing uh, kind of quality of life. Um, kind of stimulates uh, creativity in innovation, entrepreneurship, and, and ec economic uh, growth. This data is... Uh, uh, enables kind of uh, new forms of uh, economic development and so on. And of course the data, by having this kind of rich data kind of gives you uh, the ability to kind of make uh, models and simulations to predict what's going to go on in the future. What would happen if I built a hospital here? What would happen if I put a new rail route in here? What would happen if I built a new hospital here and so on? And to explore those uh, kinds of questions. Okay, all sounds great, right? All right, so I'm going to do the flip side of this now. That's all. That's the, this is why smart cities is great and why data-driven network urbanism is great. And the second part of the talk is why it also raises a whole series of challenges and we have to quite think quite carefully about what's going on in this space. So eight critiques of smart cities. I'll start here and then I'm really going to deal with the bottom uh, three. So... Part of the issue is, is things like, that da like the dashboard give the impression that cities are kind of steerable and controllable. And if I had a set of kind of data levers, I can kind of pull them around and steer, steer the kind of city through this dashboard or through this operating uh, system. But of course, we know that cities are really complex, multi-level uh, systems. There's all kinds of competing interests going on in them, and they're full of wicked problems. If you pull a lever over here, you normally cause a problem over over there, right? And that we can't just fix the city by, through these systems. They might kind of make the city uh, more knowable, but we still need to kind of think quite carefully about how we want to try and tackle problems. The second is a lot of the systems are kind of one size fits all. 
we develop a system, we can plonk it down in any city, and we can kind of try and control and manage the city uh, through it. So it's quite a historical and a spatial and homogenizing. Whereas, of course, we know that cities are very different. We know they're different in their politics, in their culture, in their history, in their ambitions, in their policy, in their politics, and so on. But cities aren't all the same, okay? And so we kind of need to think about the extent to which we want that kind of uh, bespoke and kind of diverse approach to how we want to use the data in relation to the kind of the ambitions and the culture and so on of those places. The third is it kind of promotes a form of kind of technocratic governance so, and solutionism. So this is, the, this is the idea that through technology and data, we can kind of fix and tackle any problem, okay? as opposed to, say, tackling a problem uh, through policy or through deliberative democracy or through other ways of addressing uh, issues. Okay? So my favorite example of this really is, is you're not going to fix homelessness with an app. Homelessness is a deep structural rooted problem, right, of inequality, okay? That needs redistribution of wealth and different kinds of policies, right, to intervene in that. The app might help you manage the service more effectively, but it's not gonna fix the, the deep rooted structural problem itself, okay? It's just gonna help you manage it, okay? So we probably need different kinds of policies and interventions in the area of housing than kind of technical solutions. And there's lots of other bits of the city where technical solutions aren't necessarily the best solutions. Okay. The fourth is kind of corporatization of governance and the extent to which uh, you kind of outsource various parts of these kinds of services into corporation hands and whether, um, and, you know, and whether that's really uh, fitting the city's agenda or fitting a kind of a corporate and uh, for-profit uh, agenda. The fifth is, is, is around kind of serving certain interests and uh, reinforcing particular inequality. So who is this technology aimed at? Who is it seeking to control and regulate? Whose interests is it really uh, kind of serving? And so on. And there are examples of cities, uh, say, for example, with India, where there's been quite problematic things been going on around land dispossession uh, without compensation and so on. So changes in land law and so on to, or, to compulsorily uh, take land for, to try and create these cities. And certainly the Indian cities uh, don't, in, in their kind of design plans certainly don't incorporate the, uh, the kind of uh, people who are presently living in slums and so on. These are cities for the emerging middle class. They're not kind of cities for everybody. And then there's these kind of three things like politics of urban data, the social, political, ethnical effects, and uh, buggy and brittle hackle, hackable uh, cities. And I'm going to talk about each of these in a bit more uh, detail. There's a kind of an impression that, this, that these data are kind of uh, objective, neutral, value-free, rational, commonsensical, pragmatic uh, forms of, uh, of data. But of course, big data and dashboards aren't simply uh, technical tools. They've been, um, you know, they've, they've kind of been created uh, through various kinds of systems and so on, to serve particular kinds of interests and so on. So data um, don't um, exist independently of ideas, of instruments, of practices, of contexts, of knowledges, uh, and the systems to uh, generate, process, and analyze them. There is always a politics of the data. Um, and there's always a politics around choices around those data. So for, I, uh, an example of that might be um, what's the unemployment of Dublin? Is the unemployment of Dublin uh, the unemployment within Dublin City Council? Is it the rate within the four local authorities? Is it the rate within the county? Is it the rate within the greater Dublin region? I've got four different rates. Five, well, if I count the local authorities, I've probably got eight different rates of unemployment. What is the right unemployment for Dublin? Now, I can feed any one of those back to a sitting benchmarking system and it will rate Dublin across Europe completely differently depending on which one I feed back. Which one I feed back becomes a political decision. Okay? And there's all kinds of those kind of games going on around ratings and ranking systems and around how we make choices about which data we do and we don't pick. And of course, there's a decisions made in terms of how we want to define unemployment itself. And the classic one of that, of course, was uh, in Thatcher's government where she uh, changed the definition of unemployment 18 times 
in about a two-year period, constantly changing it to try and make the problem look less and to uh, alter who is and isn't counted within those. So the data is inherently political at some level. There's no such thing, if you like, as a fact in that sense. Okay? So data, data are framed in, in different kinds of ways. And of course, these big data and these dashboards uh, express a normative notion about what should be measured, um, about for, for what reasons, and what they should tell us. Okay, so we make choices ar around those things. And of course, they have a normative effect. You know, they're being used to influence decision making, to modify institutional behavior, to condition workers, to make decisions about who gets what services, uh, and so on. So some of the work we've been trying to do around some of these systems is actually kind of unpack the socially technical assemblage that surrounds them and actually have a look at what kinds of things are influencing how the system is built. So on the one side here, we've got the kind of the technical staff. So what kind of, what kind of choices were made in relation to the, the infrastructure and the hardware through to the operating system, to the databases, to the software and the algorithms, through to the interfaces, uh, through to the users and so on. And on the right-hand side, we kind of have a kind of a, the kind of context, social, political, institutional context that frames what's kind of going on here and also frames how this actually works in practice. So from different systems of thought and forms of knowledge through to various kinds of practices, through to the finance. So how is this thing being funded? Is it through philanthropy? Is it through venture capital? Is it through other kinds of finance? Through to the political economy? Uh, that surrounds us through to governmentalities and legalities. So what are the kinds of issues around standards and protocols and uh, 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 legal requirements, regulation, compliance, uh, and so on that the system has to fit through to who is actually involved in it and their subjectivities and their communities to how the marketplace works and so on. These systems are not kind of neutral, independent systems. There's all kinds of stuff kind of going on. We kind of need to understand what's happening in that, and what's happening in uh, kind of data-driven systems. So we've been, say, like the easiest one for us to do in relation to this is kind of unpack this assemblage in relation to the dashboard. So uh, we've been kind of doing that, and we've been, we're now doing it with other, uh, with other systems. And then there are all kinds of questions around the ethics in this uh, data-driven uh, urbanism. Right, raises all kinds of uh, related questions here around data ownership and control, around data integration and data markets, around data security and integration, data protection and privacy, data quality and provenance, and uh, data uh, uses, how the data actually gets deployed to do certain things. And basically what I'm just gonna do in the next part of the talk is, is draw on this report. So this is a report that was published uh, probably about a month ago, I think now, uh, published for the Taoiseach's department. This is the Prime Minister's office in, uh, in, in Ireland. And they asked me to have a look at the kind of data privacy, data security issues in relation to uh, smart cities. So one of the issues around privacy is people tend to think of it in a quite narrow way in terms of uh, kind of... Uh, so privacy at one level can just be defined as how do we select what information we want to reveal about ourselves? So how can we kind of control that? Whereas, whereas actually privacy is a much more kind of multi-dimensional construct and, uh, and affects different kinds of domains. So we can have identity privacy, which is our personal confidential data, so bodily privacy to protect the integrity of physical person, to territorial privacy, protect personal space and objects and property, locational movement pr uh, privacy, so tracking and tracing of people's spatial behavior, uh, through to communications privacy, so protecting and surveillance of conversations and correspondence and so on, and transactional privacy, so protecting its monitoring of queries and searches and purchases and bank transfers and other kinds of exchanges uh, and so on. And that those kinds of uh, privacy can be breached in different ways. So we have, kind of pri we have different forms of privacy and we have different forms of privacy harms. So it's not just about disclosure. There's actually a whole series of different privacy harms that we need to think about, whether that's surveillance or interrogation or aggregation or identification, insecurity, secondary use, exclusion, uh, breach of confidentiality, disclosure, exposure, increased accessibility, blackmail, appropriation, distortion, intrusion, and dis uh, decisional interference. So 
there's a lot of different ways in which your privacy can be breached and, and a lot of different ways you can be harmed through that privacy breach. And the whole thing about big data is obviously it's generating huge quantities of, gener of information about people. It's intensifying datafication. So the capture and, data, uh, the capture and uh, circulation of data are becoming more indiscriminate and exhaustive. They involve all individuals, all objects, all transactions, and so on. They're becoming more distributed. They occur across multiple devices, services, and places. They're becoming platform independent, which means they can, you know, data can easily flow across different platform services and devices. Um, and it's becoming continuous. The, the data are being generated on a routine and automated basis. And in a lot of cases, it is an automated basis. Like this phone is automated generating data about me at the minute. So they have much greater levels of intensified scrutiny and different modes of uh, surveillance. And tasks that were previously unmonitored or were caught through a disciplinary uh, uh, gaze through, say, isolated CCTV cameras and so on are now being routinely uh, tracked and traced. In fact, it's almost impossible now to live our everyday lives without leaving digital footprints or, or shadows. So things that we leave ourselves and things that people uh, capture about us. So we kind of have mass recording, organizing, storing, and sharing of big data, and we have changes into which the, uh, uh, the uses to which that data can be uh, put. And we can think about that in relation to location and uh, movement data. So if I was to go back 40, 50 years and I wanted to track or trace any of you, I probably would have had to get myself a private detective and they would have literally had to follow you around. It would be quite expensive and really labor intensive to do this, okay? Whereas now we're being routinely tracked and traced in our movements through a whole series of different uh, technologies and everybody is doing it. So this mass surveillance as opposed to focused on particular individuals. So things like controllable uh, digital CCTV cameras, things like automatic number plate recognition on those cameras, so scanning the number plates, being able to automatically recognize IDs. But 30 million vehicles are captured every day in the UK through uh, AMPR cameras. Uh, facial recognition is increasingly put onto uh, cameras as a number of, uh, of uh, uh, schemes in the UK that do this, there's certainly police forces in the US that do this, Chicago and uh, New York. Uh, San Diego have even got facial recognition software on their smartphones, and they'll take a picture with the smartphone and try and identify you uh, that way. Uh, often linking across to other platforms, so it's pulling data off of Facebook and so on, and then trying to marry pictures up across uh, those kinds of databases. Could be smartphones, the smartphones track themselves in uh, different ways, so through the cell through the cell mass, through GPS embedded on the phone, and also through the Wi-Fi networks that the phone is trying to connect to. So my phone at the minute is connected to the edge room uh, network on the Wi-Fi. But I'm also broadcasting. So see the Wi-Fi me mesh is the two down below this. The Wi-Fi network across UCL is also capturing every phone that connects onto it. But because my phone has got all the uh, previous connections they're also trying to connect. So my phone is broadcasting all the previous networks I've, I've tried to connect to, to try and connect to one of them. And it found Edgy Roam and it connected. So on a Wi-Fi network, they don't just get your connecting to them, they also get your history of everywhere else you've tried to connect to or have connected to. So you also get the history as well as the present connection. It's quite interesting. We have sensor networks that can kind of track and trace. So things like uh, sensors that connect and pull off the uh, MAC address off your phone. So a good example of that was the Renewer network that was up around uh, Liverpool Street here, had a, had a network of 200 bins with sensors on. In a single week, captured four million unique devices, tracked them from bin to bin to bin, claimed it could tell which shops you'd been in, how long you'd been in them, which routes you were taking on a daily basis. Basically, the bins were tracking you across the city, right? Really fine scale, detailed. Uh, route maps, and also indications of activity as well. Smart card tracking, so barcodes, RFID chips, so on. You might have had swipe cards to get in and out of buildings. You might have your Oyster tap in, tap out card, use an RFID chip embedded in the card, and so on. Um, vehicle tracking, so you might have a 
transponder in the car will automatically open the toll booths, or automatically open the car park gates, uh, and so on. Other kinds of staging points, so using your card in an ATM, or uh, uh, buying something with a credit card, uh, or uh, metadata tagging, whatever it might be. Or it might be slightly more unusual cases, like electronic tagging of, of particular people, it might be kids, it might be uh, criminals, or uh, people on uh, uh, parole, and so on. Or there's data that we share ourselves by putting it up into Google Calendar. And okay, that might be limited to a certain number of people, but Google certainly know everywhere that you've been. Uh, and they also know off your search terms because they track the IP off the, off the, off when you're doing your searches and so on. So there's lots and lots of different ways in which location and movement data is now being uh, captured. And certainly they're not being integrated together because they're of, often, these are all different uh, players and actors and so on. But nevertheless, there is a, there's a lot of information here now being uh, generated and a lot of it can be accessed through uh, warrants and the courts and so on. And just in case you wanted to know what comes off your phone, this is what comes off your phone. This is the data permissions that can be sought by an Android app. And this is actually the default uh, position. So if you've got the Uber app on your phone, this is what it's asking for. It's asking for your email log, your messaging log, your battery temperature. No idea why they need to know your battery temperature. Uh, it's asking for all the Wi-Fi connections you're connecting to, uh, and so on and so forth. There's a huge amount of data that's being asked for that actually has nothing to do with the service or the app that you're trying to. So this is inherently open as opposed to inherently closed. If it was privacy by design, this would be closed and you would have to agree to open them. Whereas actually what we have is everything is open and then you have to try and lock it down. So this is a different kind of thing. Lots of information streaming off about us. And a lot of this data is being sold within uh, data markets. Uh, and so on. Now all this data enables us to kind of make more kinds of inferences about, about people, about places, about things that people uh, do and so on. Um, so you can kind of infer information about individuals not directly encoded in the data or the database, but, which, but nonetheless can produce uh, predictive privacy uh, harms. For example, you can look at things like uh, co-proximity and co-movement uh, with others to kind of infer political, social, and religious affiliation. And, and it's quite clear that agencies have been doing this. So two phones that are going together through the airport or going together through, uh, are, are both together going and visiting a gay bar or both together going and visiting a mosque or go both together going to a radical meeting or whatever. Two of them are together. There must be some inferencing going on, inferences we might be able to draw from here. And that's going on. And obviously, there's predictive uh, privacy harms. Uh, going on in, in relation to that. And it can produce a situation called the tyranny of the minority. So if somebody like Facebook would claim, that on the basis of knowing the sexuality of 20% of people, it can predict the other 80%. And this has led to people being uh, outed and so on by things appearing in their timeline and family members seeing them uh, and so on. So this is a kind of, you need a small number of people who share characteristics like other people to reveal those uh, characteristics. There are, there are some issues around anonymization and re-identification, particularly where it's done uh, poorly, and there are now actually companies who specialize in re-identification of, of uh, data and being able to link the data across uh, different uh, data sets. So anonymization is a, clearly a key uh, strategy for trying to uh, protect some of this data using pseudonyms or aggregation or other strategies. Of course, the pseudonym is just a, a, is also a unique uh, tag. So if you, you don't need to know the name of somebody, if you just have that tag, you can still track and trace them and infer what you want uh, from them. Uh, so, so, so when people use the phrase like anonymous identifiers, it really is a kind of an oxymoron. I, I certainly think that's the case within Google where they've got all your other kinds of information like your address and your phone number, uh, your IP address and all the rest of it. Uh, they don't need to know your name to be able to then kind of track you across its various platforms uh, and so on, and to treat you as if they do uh, know who you are. Um, and, and there's all kinds of ways in which this kind of needs to be uh, looked at about kind of trying to protect that more uh, uh, carefully. Um, there's an issue around opacity and automation kind of creates observation and uh, uh, reduces control. And that basically means we have very little idea of what's going on. 
because these systems are quite complicated, they're quite interlinked. There's very complex arrangements of data controllers and data processors. Uh, it's quite difficult to track who has generated data. Who, who in the room here knew the bins were tracking them when they walk around this area? You didn't know, right? So how do you know to be able to then go and challenge that and to find out what data they hold about you? If people are collecting data without your knowledge, how, how can you exercise your rights in relation to data protection to challenge that that is actually uh, going on? And what happens if that data has been passed through a whole agglomeration of different actors? Um, so various kinds of smart city uh, technologies are composed of these kind of interacting systems run by a set of kind of corporate and state actors. And data are being passed between different devices, platforms, services, applications, <laughs> analytics engines, shared with third parties, and so on. And across this kind of maze-like assemblage, data can be leaked, it can be intercepted, it can be transmitted, it can be disclosed, it can be uh, disassembled and reassembled across those data streams, and it can be repurposed for all kinds of diverse uh, uh, users in ways that are really difficult to uh, track and control. Moreover, the algorithms that are used to process them are black boxed. We don't actually know what's built in into the decision making uh, that, that uh, happens there. And that kind of opacity and the automation undermine the fair information practice principles that are at the heart of privacy uh, regulation in a number of respects, in the sense that it makes it very difficult for individuals to seek, uh, to verify, to query, to correct, and to delete data, or even to know who to ask. Uh, to know how the data is collected about them, how it's used, how it's assessed for, uh, uh, to assess how fair any actions upon the, on that data is, or to hold the data controllers uh, to account. And the data are being repurposed and uh, used in unpredictable and unexpected uh, ways. One of the key principles of data, regula uh, data protection regulation is data minimization, which basically means the data can only be used for the purpose for which it was generated. It can't be used for all these other purposes over, over here. In the big data age, that's, you know, that's out the window, right? The whole point around big data is repurposing it for lots of different uh, ways to extract value out of it and, and to uh, gain an insight into it. Um, and, this, you know, and so companies and, and states and so on are kind of repackaging, repurposing uh, uh, the data and they have, uh, the, the loophole, of course, is you do this on the derived data and not the raw data, and then you're outside the data protection uh, uh, regulation. And data brokers are, are, are using this data in all kinds of ways that affect people's uh, life chances. So using the data to, to make decisions about whether people get the job, whether they get the loan, whether they get the mortgage, whether they, who their potential partner might be on a dating site, whatever it might be, right? Okay. But you have no idea as to what data fed into that and also how it was passed through those algorithms. You don't know why you didn't get the job, right? You just got told you didn't get it or why you weren't shortlisted. You just didn't, you just didn't uh, uh, get turned up. So these data make big differences and these data broker companies are, are huge multi-billion dollar uh, companies, okay? Somebody, a company like Axicom, uh, a few years ago now, and they certainly have way more data than this now, we claim to have 1,500 data points by, uh, related to 500 million people. A data point is male, white, 45, you know. And they, what they're doing is buying up various kinds of data out of these kinds of websites and different technologies, buying up credit card data, buying up Facebook, Twitter data, social media data, uh, health insurance data, whatever it might be court record data, pulling it all together and then kind of creating profiles around people and then kind of selling all those kind of profiling and uh, data analytics on. Okay, so it's a, uh, it's a big kind of industry where, where we have very little knowledge about what's actually going on inside of it. And, uh, and a, a bunch of the companies actually got subpoenaed in the US where the uh, FTC kind of said, look, you have to tell us what the heck it is that you're doing because we have no idea what it is that you're, that you're doing or how you're doing it. And lastly, notice and consent are largely absent in some of these uh, technologies. Notice and consent sit right at the heart of fair information practice principles. Uh, you're meant to tell people you're collecting data and you're meant to tell the, uh, and you're meant to get their permission. Okay, so which is why you get your terms and conditions on different things uh, and so on. So you're meant to kind of click on it and say, yes, I agree to you uh, collecting all this information uh, about me. Of course, a lot of smart city technology there is no notice of consent. 
the bin, never asked me whether it could pull my MAC address. The CCTV camera didn't ask whether it could take my photo. The AMPR camera didn't ask whether it could scan my number plate. And it, it's almost impossible for, it, for those kind of things to happen, right? If you're kind of doing that kind of level of uh, mass uh, surveillance. You know, it's too uh, onerous. Uh, and it's too onerous, actually, for people to try and police that themselves. You know, if you were to go and read all the terms and conditions of every piece of software or app you've ever downloaded, You'd be there for a really long time, right? I think, uh, I think it's a PayPal or eBay or one of them. Their terms and conditions are 37,000 words long. It's longer than Hamlet, right? It would take you a long time to go through that. And you can't negotiate any of them. You either accept them or you don't. You can't go back and say, I don't like Cause 19. Can we alter that? You just click or you don't click, right? That's it. We've no idea what's in there. Often there's a clause in there that says, we can change the terms and conditions without consultation in the future to whatever the hell we like. For a third of apps in the Android and the uh, Apple stores don't have any privacy policies on them at all. In fact, you just downloading the app is you consenting to them to pulling whatever data they want off your phone. And often you're consenting to other things, like you'll give them permissions to allow them to turn on the microphone or the camera or to access all the bits of the phone. So, and there's obviously there's no ability to kind of opt out on those systems. So. In those kind of smart city technologies like AMPR and, uh, and the bins and so on, there's, there's no sense in which a person can selectively reveal themselves. You know, if you, if you have to walk past the camera to come to your place of work, you have to walk past the camera. That's not a choice. There's no choice of opting out of these systems. You know, you, you kind of have to interact with them at some level. Um, So that's just, these are just actually the fair information practice principles, if you're not uh, familiar with them. They're from 1980. They're set up by the OECD. Um, and they've slowly been eroded over time. And they're probably redundant in the big data age. And they need to be uh, kind of uh, revisited. The FTC in the US, I think, just recognized four, which are the ones I've uh, highlighted. And they really just recognize uh, notice and consent to a large, de to a large degree. And this use, uh, this use uh, principle here basically has kind of gone out, gone out the window. And then we could come to what are the other kinds of issues around uh, some of these technology in our cities around to what extent might we be making them vulnerable in relation to uh, uh, them being buggy or they're being hackable or they're being uh, 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 brittle. And there's a bit of, bit of work now kind of going on in relation to looking at the cybersecurity around, uh, around city uh, technologies and to the extent to which things like traffic light systems can be hacked or electricity grids can be hacked or the water treatment plant can be hacked. Uh, one of the examples I've got in the report is of a water treatment plant that was hacked and uh, 1.5 million liters of raw sewage was let out into the water supply. Okay. Basically makes all the water uh, unusable. Serious kind of intervention, right? Okay. And it does need to be, you know, anything that's networked and has got software in can be hacked. Okay. And there's now quite a lot of attention being uh, focused on some of these issues and looking at some of the various issues. So the various issues are things like weak security and encryption. A lot of, a lot of systems are using their original manufacturing uh, setup, the manufacturing passwords and codes. A you know, whole set of things running on Windows XP or Windows NT or God knows what else, right? A whole set of legacy systems that have got forever day exploits, let alone zero day exploits. Okay, a lot of uh, vulnerabilities built in. Um, and poor maintenance of systems. Uh, large complex attack surfaces and interdependencies. This is particularly the case for things like the Internet of Things, particularly where they're using low power sensors where you can't encrypt at either end. Okay, and then various chains through which things are passing, and you can intervene at various uh, different points. Uh, various kinds of issues around cascade effects. And the cascade effects really is the argument against going for integrated systems. Uh, there's a really good reason why you have silos. And that's is if someone gets hold of your traffic control room, you also don't want them to be able to get hold of your electricity grid and your water system and your emergency management system and everything else, right? Okay. So the kind of cascade, potential cascade effects, one thing infects another, infects another, and so on. And then there are issues around human error and disgruntled in employees. And if you download that report, you'll see 
this is not this is not me kind of doing scare stories. If you kind of go and have a look, there's a whole series of examples of ways in which uh, smart city systems have actually uh, have been hacked and are routinely being uh, are routinely being uh, hacked. Um, and of course, what this leads to is the operational security is the way through to get to the uh, to the data. So the reason why I've got data breaches in there is because you can get through the operational security, you can often get to the data. So when one of the large retailers in the US lost 100 million uh, customer records, they were hacked through the uh, heating and air conditioning system, and then they hadn't properly segmented the data layer, so once getting into one, you could get onto the other, and you could steal all the records out. Okay. And then what I was asked to do is, well, what are the solutions to these various kinds of issues, right? So if we want to go back to the beginning of the talk and the positive bit, lots of potential benefits, right? Lots of benefits about efficiency and competitiveness and better knowledge and better governance and so on. But there's also these potential downsides. So how do we, how do we resolve that kind of uh, issue? And I was asked to kind of come up with some solutions without uh, going near law. So I couldn't do anything legal. Uh, partly because that's uh, EU competency, that's not uh, uh, like an Irish competency, like data protection. Like data protection law is uh, done at the e EU level. Okay, so we could look at what the market could do. So my solution was multi-pronged, actually, and kind of said, well, look, we need to look at what the market itself could do in relation to industry standards, in relation to self-regulation uh, and so on, as a way of uh, looking at things like privacy as competitiveness of actually offering people proper privacy as a way of tempting them to use their service as opposed to a service that's open and is uh, mining data about the people who use their uh, service. Or it could be more technological solutions. So this is proper kind of end-to-end -end, uh, strong encryption. It's about ac access control, security controls, uh, proper audit trails and backups, updating of uh, patching so things are constantly being uh, patched on a rolling basis rather than just when things uh, kind of go wrong. Uh, there are things around policy and regulation, so actually looking at those fair information practice principles and trying to update them uh, into the uh, 21st century, and there are people looking at doing that. So there are initiatives around uh, a kind of internet bill of rights or a network bill of rights. Uh, there's issues around, uh, there's uh, initiatives around things like a Magna Carta for data, uh, and so on. So there's people kind of looking at trying to update those, those things. There's things like privacy by design, which most uh, states uh, would advocate, and most uh, uh, information commissioners and so on would advocate. This is you build your privacy in from the get-go. So when you're actually going through your requirements analysis and you're designing your system, you're actively thinking about privacy and you're doing privacy impact assessments on what your app or your system might actually do. And you build it in right from the very start. You don't build your app and then try to work out how you're gonna make it layer on the privacy or the security afterwards. As you do it right from the get-go, and it's the same thing with uh, security by design. You, you think about the security right from the very start. You don't build your system and then try to work out how you're gonna make it secure, okay? It's much more likely to be secure and private if you uh, do it that way. And then lastly was kind of governance. And, and thinking about what cities themselves can, can do. Um, and I kind of had three uh, four kind of levels for this. The first one was really around uh, vision and strategy. So things like having smart city advisory boards and having a smart city strategy that takes seriously these issues around privacy and uh, security uh, and so on and thinks about it in relation to what kind of city we want to, uh, we want to live in. Okay, so if citizens can't actively manage this, then the city should manage it on their behalf. If they're procuring uh, these various kinds of systems, they should be writing into the procurement, this is what data you can collect, this is how you can collect it, this is who you can share it with, this is what you can do with it, and so on and so forth, right? And there are cities who have lost control of their own data through things like procuring out systems, and they found that who they procured to now owns the data, and if they want their data about their waste management, or about their bike share scheme, or whatever it might be, they have to buy it back off the company. Okay. If they'd done it through the procurement process, they would still own that data and they could make the data uh, open uh, and so on. That there is actually proper oversight and uh, delivery and uh, compliance. Um, so this is things like smart city governments, risk, ethics uh, board might meet once a month or might meet four times a year. So I sit on one of these for a national statistics office 
And basically, when they're coming up with new official statistics or new ways of generating their data, they have to go through this kind of privacy impact assessment and security assessment. They have to kind of think all the different ways in which they can maintain public trust uh, and so on. So it's an active process of thinking through these uh, kind of things. Core, actual core privacy team, people in local authorities whose job it is to carry out privacy impact assessment, to actually go and look at these technologies and work out what is and isn't being collected and generated uh, and so on. And lastly, a kind of computer emergency response team. What happens if a bit of your city is hacked? Who responds? Okay. Now in Ireland, that's just happened last November. So November 2015, there is now a national computer emergency response team. And in a country like Ireland, where there's only four and a half million people, it probably makes sense that you only need one of these that can go between the different cities and can also deal with other kinds of uh, hacking or denial of service attacks uh, and so on. Interestingly, if you want to get in contact with them, the office is only open between nine and five Monday to Friday. So if you want to hack Ireland, my suggestion is do it at the weekend. <laughs> right, to conclude then. Um, we're entering an era of uh, embedded and uh, mobile uh, computation. Lots more kind of sensors and actuators, lots of different devices, all networked together, all producing lots of uh, data. So we're producing kind of vast quantities of data, and it's in real, it's in, a lot of it's in real time, and city infrastructure is becoming responsive to that data, and it's enabling new kinds of monitoring, regulation, uh, and control. So cities are becoming uh, uh, kind of uh, data driven, and they're enacting new forms of algorithmic uh, governance. Um, and while, and while uh, this kind of data driven urbanism undoubtedly uh, provides a set of uh, solutions for urban problems, it also is also raising a number of kind of uh, ethical and normative questions that we kind of need to think through. And often what's kind of happening in these situations is the technology is running ahead of these things, right? So same with these, with these mobile phones, right? These went into mass circulation really fast, very, very quick adoption, and then kind of regulation and thought, uh, critical thought about them, and so on, has followed in its wake. Okay, and we kind of need to get much more uh, savvy at actually thinking through what are the implications of these technologies? How can they uh, serve us and do, and do good in our society, but also how can we limit any of their kind of pernicious effects, any kind of negative effects that we, that we, don't, uh, that we don't want? You know, so in, in a sense, uh, what I'm asking is, is that we get a bit smarter about thinking about smart cities in that sense. And I'm gonna end uh, there. Thanks very much. Okay, well, thank, thank you very much. We, we have enough Sorry, that was a bit questions. long. So. Um, do we have any, any questions? Would like to start? Okay, I have a question. Um, yeah. I have one in reserve. Um, in Dublin, the yeah. potholes, you mentioned the potholes right yeah. at the very beginning. I'm wondering, um, with smart data, is there an enhanced sort of uh, growing expectation that there will be response? No. And what no. impact does it have on local authority budgets? This is, this is, a, this is a, a, a good question, right? The solution to this is you don't tell anybody the app exists. Yeah. And in fact, a lot of people who use it are local authority workers. And they'll tell you there's the graffiti and there's a pothole. There's been no advertising campaign. So Fix Your Street is the, is the website, fixyourstreet.ie. And every single local authority in Ireland is part of the Fix Your Street. Now, it does have different implications. It was built by one local authority who basically tailored it for their CRM system. So it doesn't quite work in other places. So some local authorities, you, you upload your photo and so on, but actually what it does is it generates an email, and an email then gets passed around an organization, whereas in that local authority, it actually goes straight into their CRM and becomes part of their workflow. I think if everybody did know about it and everybody was using it, it would overwhelm yeah. the system, and they would have to have some way of trying to prioritize uh, what would be the tasks that you would, you, would then go and, you would then go and do. But the system itself has the potential. It's not used in this way, but it is used this way in other cities Becomes a, it, becomes a measure, it becomes a way of being able to measure performance. You know, so you can kind of bring the team in and kind of say, well, last week you fixed 50 potholes, and the week before you did 14, but this week you only did uh, 30. So what's going on in this team, and why are you underperforming, and so on? 
Okay, and so there are, there are some cities, uh, places like uh, Baltimore, Atlanta, and so on, who are highly metric driven, and they have, they have weekly meetings in a. So in, in Atlanta, they have a they have a purpose built dashboard room, and they have weekly meetings in it, and they go through the performance of all the different departments in the city, and they're pulling in this kind of data, and then they're they're doing this, yeah. Uh, thank you uh, for, the, for the very interesting talk. It gave me a lot to think about. Um, one of the things I was wanted to ask about, I guess, is one of the things that I, I, th I think I noticed, and I'm not sure if you would agree, is that the, the, the form of urbanism that you were referring to was grounded in pretty significant ways in the domains of you know, urban management, urban planning, urban policy, monitoring, control. And I was just wondering if you could talk a bit about um, perhaps another form of urbanism, which is also increasingly data-driven, which is sort of more urban public life. And I'm thinking, for instance, of the, way, the ways in which people increasingly, you know, they'll talk about their neighborhoods or debate mm -hmm. over social media, which, of course, mm -hmm. um, also very much data-driven and, and also very much governed by the nature of those particular platforms. And people talk about data journalism as well, increasingly. And I guess, because when you got to the point where you're talking about solutions, a lot of the solutions were in those domains of management, planning, policy. Um, and I'm, and I'm, I think that, you know, obviously those are areas of potential solution. But also I was thinking that, of course, there has to be discourses around these things or debates, public debates. But the, tr the thing is, is that a lot of those debates are occurring through domains that are also really data driven. Yeah, and in fact, the local authorities in Dublin do have these platforms for the debate. So there's a company called Civic that provides a, like a platform where you can have a debate around the, um, uh, the development plan for the area, for example. So it's kind of facilitated discussion through, I guess it's kind of a, a dedicated social media channel, if you like, where they can push out documents and data and so on, and then the public can respond uh, back to them. So that is the argument around more kind of participation and more kind of openness and more transparency. Uh, you know, you can facilitate this kind of civic hacking and, uh, and that kind of uh, participation. At, at a political level, I'm a little bit dubious about it because what, what often happens is people get the data and they can mess around and they'll do this. You know, so they might produce a kind of a health app, but actually the real politics is two levels above that where the health service is being dismantled. So you give the people the notion that they're being empowered to, to build stuff and do stuff, but actually the real politic is somewhere, is somewhere else, you know? So it's almost a distraction to give people those tools in that sense, and you actually really need real politics. But yeah, so there is a sense, you know, I would like to think that the Dublin dashboard does give people in the city, uh, you know, the data whereby they can, or the evidence that they can then start to challenge things. So they can take the data along to their constituency office or into the local council forum and present the evidence back and, and give a counter narrative or counter discourse and so on. So it can potentially do that, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but yeah, no, I was really looking at the, con the kind of management control side, though, yeah, for mo in the, obviously in the most of this talk, because I think that's where most of the um, key issues are actually. Uh, what would what would be your comment uh, for the exchange of fire between FBI and Apple? I think the well, I haven't really been following that closely to be honest. But like, I think there's a difference between unlocking somebody's phone and putting a back door into the entire system. That would be uh, my initial position to start to think about it, because uh, the FBI is not actually asking for the back door into that phone. They're just asking for that phone to be unlocked. There's a di it's a different thing to say we want to be able to get into everybody's phone, you know? So um, that's it. Without, without like going and reading a load of stuff and get myself and thinking through my own position, that's about as far as I go on it, I think. Well, just on that issue, I can't believe actually the FBI can't access it anyway. I find that slightly strange, but anyway, that's another issue. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to work to your conclusion, um, and I'm struggling to establish where you are in some respects. Yep. So I think you quite rightly lay out serious pitfalls and serious issues. Mm -hmm. I'm not denying any of that at all. Um, and in one level, your conclusion is to say, don't do it. 
Um, so I don't, I don't know the extent to which you believe a city can be smart and the extent to which you would like to live in a smart city. And I do think the, uh, the, the, the first question also raised the dichotomy of people in this room are probably thinking, oh, that's all a bit scary. And yet many people in this room expect to have access to data to use that to both run their lives and indeed contribute to the politics of their neighborhood in a new way. So we have to work our way through this, is mm. my sort of contention. And I would also contend that with the right controls planned at the beginning, actually um, an institution doing it in a transparent way should be able to harness data to actually really make uh, the urbanism and the planning of a place very effective. Yeah. So. Yeah, so I kind of agree with what, what you're saying. And my position is not totally ambiguous. I mean, um, I'm one of these people, who, it, there's a really nice quote about technology. It's neither, it's neither good nor bad, but nor is it neutral, OK? Um, and, and it's always productive, right? So it always does stuff. So I'm never normally against something outright, because normally there's a, it's doing useful things. What I'm more interested in is making sure that it's doing more use than it's doing harm. And it's about trying to get the balance between those two things. And whether we like it or not, our cities are going to adopt these technologies because they do actually provide lots of real benefits. If you go and spend time in a traffic control room and you see when part of the system goes down, if it didn't exist, the city would be gridlocked. Like it is actually doing a lot of good in that sense, right? And it's keeping the system flowing and so on. And, the, and you know, what I'm more concerned about is when you've got these kind of flows of data and they end up being repurposed and reused in ways which people weren't expecting or intending and can potentially uh, come back and bite them without them necessarily realizing that's the case. So it's about putting in, I guess, the controls and brakes that make sure that we get the benefits without the kind of negative stuff. So I'm for the smart city in the sense of I think that networked urbanism can do a lot of good. You know, it can give us a lot more efficient energy, a much more kind of responsive kind of energy, new kinds of energy markets, whatever it might be on, say, energy stuff or much better kind of transport system and so on. But I do think we have to think quite carefully about the surveillance effects of some of this stuff and thinking through, well, how do we want to tackle those kinds of things? And I think the kinds of suggestions that I'm making are very kind of practical, uh, uh, pragmatic kind of interventions. They're not trying to lock everything down and say, look, we're going we're gonna to say this can't exist. What we're saying is, is look, uh, let's try, you know, like, I think like something like privacy by design, most people would probably be quite, be quite happy with, actually. You know, the, the idea that, you know, your phone is effectively locked down until you make the choice to open it up. You know, it's just a quick, you know, it's a flip round, but it actually do, we would make a huge difference in, ter in terms of what kind of data is being uh, produced and shared uh, and so on. So that's, that's my position, basically. I, don't, I, I think it's pointless to be completely against it. I just... It's because there are a whole series of benefits from it. And if you go and spend any time uh, in some of these teams and look at what they're trying to do, um, particularly on, I'm, talk, I'm talking about on the state side, I'm not necessarily talking about the corporate side. It's very difficult to get into the corporate side to actually see what's going on. And it's very difficult to get into, some, say, some of the data market um, brokers and so on to see what's going on um, there. But you know, people who run cities are normally trying to run the cities for, for, the, for the benefit of the people living there. But there can be all these side effects and other kinds of wicked problems that come up that they're not intended or necessarily know. Yeah. I think uh, talking to all the people in Dublin, they're, le they're learning lessons by this. So they, they did lose their, their data through some of their procurement schemes. And now they've kind of changed their procurement. So they're kind of doing this learning by, you know, and they're starting to think about some of this stuff like smart city governance and smart city strategy and so on. So, so really up until last year, Dublin was the accidental smart city. It wasn't planned, right? It was like a series of these kind of projects happening in different departments, in different local authorities. It all kind of just happened. No conversations going on, no connected thinking, joined up thinking. Whereas now they have a thing called Smart Dublin, which is actually launched uh, next week, where they've, where they've started to kind of create a, a kind of a story around this and to pull it together and to put it into a narrative and to an, into a strategy and to start to put some of these kind of policies in place. And I think a lot of cities are going to start trying to, to do that. It's partly pushed back against vendor-led uh, development, which is really 
it was kind of the start of the smart city stuff. The, the companies were setting the agenda and the cities were following and uh, cities have now taken back the agenda and said, we're only doing this if it actually works, does what we want it to do. So that was a long answer. We have one more question here. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. It was very interesting to see that Dublin has a very uh, neat and I hope, I think it's uh, helpful that dashboard, uh, while London's was like a little bit like a toy. Um, so I don't really have a question, but I wanted to share some thoughts with you. I liked uh, when you um, presented, when you said about uh, Thatcher's um, definitions of unemployment reminded me of uh, our situation. I'm Greek, and uh, it's often said that uh, Greeks uh, has managed to get the euro by employing creative uh, statistics, and um, the results we see are not very um, good right now. It's in a very difficult position. Another thing is that um, as you said, the, the quote you said was uh, actually, I think, Marvin um, uh, Kranzberg's uh, first mm -hmm. law of uh, technology, and the mm -hmm. second one is really nice too. It says that uh, um, invention is the mother uh, um, of necessity. It doesn't go the other way around. And then uh, finally, uh, my thought is because I'm, I'm uh, currently studying um, machine learning at uh, Architect at Bartlett School. Well, um, applied in architectural and urban studies, and we're doing a similar uh, study on these subjects. Um, what I have, I have the feeling that we we always are very um, uh, preoccupied, maybe with. Um, how um, our data are, are going to be judged by some uh, subject, but uh, in, in, a f in really it's not seen by any human, but mostly the computer does mm -hmm. the, the whole categorization. Mm -hmm. So the whole job is done by a uh, digital subject. Mm -hmm. And f maybe we're becoming uh, digital subjects ourselves, and maybe that's the price we have to pay to have such wonderful tools to go around our businesses yeah. and lives. Thank you. Yeah, so the last bit about algorithms is really interesting, I think really important, because we are ceding a lot of work now to algorithms to do automated work. Like, so for so example, the congestion charge in, in London, if you, that's done off an AMPR camera, they scan your number plate, pings off to the DVLC, and they see whether you've paid or not. And then if you haven't paid within 24 hours, a letter is printed off, put in an envelope and sent to you, and there's no people involved in that system. It's entirely an automated system, and the algorithm makes the choice that it's going to uh, send this off to you. So we are kind of uh, living in an era where we're getting more increasing algorithmic governance, and there's some now interesting debates going on around algor algorithms. So uh, one of the ones I'm interested in is uh, it's called, um, it kind of does it at three levels. So it talks about human in the loop, on the loop, and off the loop. So there's some systems where the algorithm does the work, but then it pings it off to a person, and the person then makes the decision. So it identifies a condition, and then you have to say, yes, do that. Um, so where this debate is really important at the minute is in relation to killer drones. So it's a, it's a big debate in the drone um, thing. Um, you know, are you going to seed the drone to be able to make the decision to make the kill? Or do you, you know, so the human on the loop is, uh, the, is the algorithm has the has the ability to do it automatically, to do something automatically, but somebody is monitoring it and it can inter and intervene. And that typically goes on in a traffic control room. So all the traffic light sequencing in Dublin, for example, is done is a, uh, done off an automated system. And actually, every time you go up to traffic lights, they, they, they're on green for a different amount of time. It's taking the data and it alters it and it bases it on the traffic flow going through and so on. But there is a controller who can intervene at any time and actually override the system and say, actually, it's not going to be on for 60 seconds this time. It's going to be on for 90 because I want to clear that backlog and, and do something right. So that's human on the loop, but the algorithm works otherwise. And off the loop is you just seed everything to the, to, to the, to the algorithm, you know. Um, and in things like killer drones, it makes it, it's, a, it, it's crucial, right? You know, if you're going to say, if you're going to allow a, ro a robot or a drone to, to, to kill someone without oversight, that's a big, a big decision. You want to make sure the algorithm is right and you've got really good data. 
and I'm not convinced we've got either. And also, we can't look at the algorithm. And a lot of it, of course, is going on the basis of metadata, not on the basis of real data. So, you know, the CIA, head of the CIA saying, you know, we kill people on the basis of metadata. Another you know? thing is also responsibility. That it's always responsibility to kill. Is, is, the, is the one that uh, uh, writes the code, or is the, if he's on the loop, or, so I think it's yeah. very important to know also the responsibility. Yeah. So I do think that in these systems, we do want to make decisions about uh, uh, where do we want to leave the responsibility and who has the responsibility and so on. And that's going to be decisions that don't just affect drones, right, but all kinds of those smart city technologies as to where we want people in or on or off the, off, uh, the loop. I just want to go back to the person before when we were saying about the policies. If you, if, you, if you want to see a really good data policy, one that I have in the report, actually, it's TFL's. TFL's data policy is really transparent. And you know, you are saying you've got these, some of these apps and they've got thousands of lines of things. TFLs is really short. It's in plain English. It tells you exactly what data they collect. They tell you exactly what its purpose is for. They tell you exactly who is doing the analysis on it and where they're located. So this data is processed in London and in Mumbai or something like that. And it's all less than the, every one of the statements is a thousand words. Really easy. So it can, it can be done, right, that we can make this stuff a lot more uh, transparent and controllable, you know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I think probably time is pressing on. We've arrived at the last question. Uh, yeah, uh, hi, my uh, question is quite related to the current subject. Uh, I'm working with machine learning, so my mm -hmm. interest is um, where, to how, to what extent is the machine learning algorithms, like learning algorithms, applied in uh, city management? Because uh, we spoke yeah. about like traffic light controls. Uh, these are rule-based systems that are not really smart. You just have to have a human being really supervising whether they are doing the right thing. But what about systems that actually can f learn to fix their mistakes? And uh, where would you see there's the biggest potential for applying such AIs? I think it's going to be, that's going to be the really big growth area, is people looking at how do you start to do simulation, optimization, prioritization, prediction, you know, profiling, um, and so on. And, you know, like Mike's team in CASA are doing some of that kind of work, and there are other, there are other kind of, um, kind of university teams and company, companies who are trying to kind of work work that out so yeah it becomes a much more yeah it does start to kind of learn and become more adaptive and responsive I think we're just at the start of that really it's it, there's a there's a loads of work to be done on trying to um, create better models really and um, and to create better kind of training you know tr training data sets and to get things working where do I think I think the key thing is in planning actually in being able to try and uh, uh, do long-term forecasting and actually, and also do simulation, like what you know, what would happen if we increased the number of trains on this line by two an hour, or what would happen if we extended this line, or if we put an investment in this area. I think that's where it's really going to be. Whether it will be on operational governance, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure there's all that kind of stuff going on within. Um, uh, things like automated cars and so on. There's all kinds of stuff going on in there. You know. There's also a lot of interest in the ethical debates going on, of course, in, in automated cars. A lot, of these, a, lot, a lot of those teams actually have philosophers in them because there's all sorts of awkward questions, right? Like, uh, so the, the typical example is the runaway tram problem. You know, do you kill everybody in the car or do you kill everybody at the bus stop? The car has to make the decision, right? It has to be programmed into it somewhere. So... You know, so there's some ethical questions there. You know, do you want to try and take a consequentialist approach or a deontological approach, or do you want to take a different kind of stance and so on? So I think there's, I think there's going to be loads of interesting kind of ethical questions around this, and there'll be loads of questions around the extent, you know, around kind of machine learning, the extent again you want to, ex ex you know, seed control to it, the extent to which it's transparent, and we can actually understand the evolution of the of the algorithm and so on, and actually work out. You know, be confident that, that we know what it's doing and why it's doing it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we've reached the time when we need to go and drink the wine.
the course somebody else steals it. Um, but I'd like to thank uh, Rob for a very stimulating talk this evening. Thank you for your practice.